Welcome to Our Lady's Victory Garden. Well, today we're going to be starting our seeds for spring. We're in February and we're actually expecting a snowstorm uh, this evening. And we're gonna go ahead and show you how we start our seeds. And I'll start right now and show you, we've got two flats set up. So these trays you can use year to year. If you wanna reuse your trays, I would recommend washing them with warm soapy water or even a just diluted bleach. And one, Thing we've really enjoyed using are, uh, these are locally made in our state of Connecticut. They're called cow pots. And they're made out of composted cow manure and dried. And there's absolutely no smell to them whatsoever. But the nice thing about using these pots is that when you grow something in there, you can plant it directly into the ground without removing it from the container. These can be planted. So you'll start to see over time roots actually penetrating through the actual container itself. And then you can just place them in and, and it actually helps fertilize naturally your seedlings and decrease the shock to them because you're not actually taking them out of the container. But I will show you, we'll, we'll show you a couple of different ways of starting seeds. Um, first, the way that we're, we're most com comfortable doing it. And we may start actually some seeds, um, our annuals in traditional six packs. But for the vegetables, I really do like this because it gives them that extra boost of, of food. Now, in terms of what we use um, for the soil, uh, this happens to be what I've settled on. It's called bumper crop. It's, you certainly can use whatever um, you want to use. But this also has some composted cow manure. It has good things in there like worm castings, um, crab shells, kelp meal. And the reason why I like this is that I like to grow certain large plants such as tomatoes. This, this isn't how I would start if I were doing microgreens, for instance, where you're not wanting to take those to a maturity. But I like to get the plants pretty good size before they go into the garden, such as tomatoes. So in order for them to mature, you really need to have them get a lot of nutrients. And I like to do that naturally. So I'd like to use soil that has a lot of good organic matter in it so that as these plants grow, they can mature inside and then I can move them out. And uh, this is another option that you can use to start seeds. It's made out of coconut husks. And this would be good if you were doing say microgreens, um, starting your, your seeds using that. You just open this up and add water and it starts to get soft. It's one of the advantages of using something like this is that it, it really does a nice job of retaining moisture. And in our outside grow boxes that are waist high, that are wood, cedar, they do recommend using a certain percentage of this in the boxes because if you just were to put dirt, regular dirt, it would be too heavy. And so we actually put quite a bit of this, maybe about a third of the material that's in those boxes is this uh, coconut husks to lighten it up. And it also keeps things moist um, through the summer. So, that, so that's definitely an option. Now, we don't start all of our plants early. Some of them we direct sow. So I wanted to mention a couple of those, some of those things that we don't start in, in early. I typically don't start cucumbers early. I find they do really well direct sow. Our winter squash, for instance, those would be things that we don't start ahead of time. We just put right in. These are fast growing. And the other thing about winter squash or summer squash, such as these varieties, here's another winter squash variety, um, and our zucchinis, is that they send down a long taproot. And one thing I noticed one year is that we kept these too long in our greenhouse in pots. And when they send a taproot down and they hit against a, a pot bottom, it stunts them and it causes some long-term problems for the plant. So my feeling with this is just put those direct sow in. They, they start so quickly and when they, when they do emerge from the soil, they're, they're, first of all, they're large seeds. These are very large seeds and they grow very, very quickly. So you don't need to have that jump on the season. 
Also things like beans. These are gonna be some yellow beans we're gonna try in the garden this year. Green beans would be another one. This would be around the time in February where you might wanna start beets. We have traditional packets, but I also wanted to show you this as an option. This is gonna go direct into the garden. Um, I do like the Detroit dark red. I love dark, dark uh, beet um, as opposed to some of the golden beets. Um, my preference is the dark red. Uh, but these come in tape, uh, so it becomes, let's see if I opened one of these, I think I might have opened this one. But these, um, here, the carrots are nice too. I want to just show you what that looks like. So this is the seed tape. So you just separate it here, and you're gonna take this and lay this out so you'd make like a little trough in your dirt, not very deep, just like this, just enough. You would lay this in the soil in the row you want to do, and then you put enough dirt just so you don't see it anymore. That's my good indicator. So you make kind of a, you might take a, you could take a spoon, you could take anything, your finger, and make a trough so it's, it's this would be able to sit in it and then be covered over so you don't see the tape anymore. And the nice thing is, is that you don't have to count out seeds and, and everything. It's, and this will just degrade right into the soil and uh, will be gone. And so I'd like to use that approach often. Uh, I have planted last summer, We I don't think we had the seed tape for the beets. And I ended up putting quite a few beets, probably more than this in, in a deeper density, um, which was nice. The radishes, it just simplifies things. I've, I've used the seed tape for the lettuce a number of times. And I really like this variety, the Black Seed Simpson. This is the one that I've had so much luck with it just coming back year to year. I let it grow and it goes to seed in the middle of summer, drops its seeds, and then every spring we end up with so many, we call them volunteer, volunteer plants that just grew up from last year's seeds. So uh, this is a very hardy, tasty, and does well through the entire summer variety. And we're up here in Connecticut, so, um, it does get warm, quite warm in the summer. The other thing where I love to plant are sugar snap peas. They do extremely well. They're gonna go into the garden directly, but I have another technique which I hope to show you, but I won't be starting that for about maybe another three, four weeks. And that's taking these tall sugar snap peas. They're gonna go quite, quite tall, maybe five, six feet. And putting them in those traditional big clay pots that you often see on people's patios that they grow all sorts of annuals or things like that. I'll put a large tomato cage into the pot and put maybe five or six seeds all around the perimeter. And what that'll do, and I'll put one of those or two of those in my greenhouse in mid-March. So by mid-April, it's able to go outside. And then we end up getting about a month early start on the sugar snap peas. So instead of planting them outside in April, we're moving out a couple pots out of our greenhouse that were started in the middle of March, and they're already quite a quite a ways away, um, or quite a ways into the growing season. They're only this variety here is only 70 days to harvest. So if you start them in the greenhouse in a big pot in mid March, by mid April, 30 days in, you're putting them outside. You're only a little over a month from actually getting the the sugar snaps, and you need to have pollinators. So it's always good to then start bringing them out. Now in April, I'll put some rows of these into the into Our Lady's Victory Garden and those will grow up. So I'll have kind of a succession of, of harvest coming in. The snowbird pea will also be direct sow. I don't start that in the greenhouse early. These do not need to be staked. They're very short. They're gonna be probably about 18 inches tall. Those can go just as a nice row. I've planned that for one row in one of our raised beds within the enclosure. And those are uh, very, I like those, they're easy to, to harvest right at your waist. And they're just some of the first things that you can start getting out of the garden. And they do very well in the, in the cold, so that's good. Um, and then I'll be taking you through some of the things we're planting. I already started some of our nasturtium and I'll show you that in our greenhouse uh, about a month ago. And so I'll show you, those are very large seeds. I ended up keeping some of our seeds from last year not that we had to, but uh, I always am just one of those people who likes to, just in, in the off chance that seeds are difficult to find. And last year, what we did find is a couple of the seed companies we order from, 
uh, or one in particular actually, was not filling orders for home gardeners. They were filling, um, filling them for commercial gardeners until later uh, into the season were they filling the ones for the home gardeners. And so I was really happy that I happened to have some seeds. Now, you have to know what kind of seeds you have. Now, if you've been growing anything that's a hybrid, those are gonna not be a good seeds to keep because they're not reliable as terms of the following year of the characteristics. But if you have some heirloom varieties, uh, then those can be kept. And nasturtiums are one of the ones that are really easy to keep. Um, one of the things you do is you just, you take a paper towel, you gather your seeds, you lay them out on the paper towel by the windowsill within about two weeks or on a heater. In about two weeks, or we have radiators, which are really nice. After about two weeks, they dry out. And once they feel kind of crunchy, like everything around them is a bit crunchy, like I'm thinking of when we have spaghetti squash and you're just kind of taking all that gooey stuff out from the squash. Um, and then when that gets kind of crunchy where the, the seeds kind of just break off, they're dry enough to put in an envelope. And then I label them and then we have them for the next year. So the ones I've started, the nasturtium, were actually ones from the garden last year. And then I've got some new seeds, but um, but uh, yeah, we've got a few herbs we wanna start. We're gonna be starting celery, uh, which takes a really long time to mature. And we're gonna start some tomatoes. So let me show you how that's going to work. So one of the things you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna label the varieties that you wanna grow. So we're gonna put those here, some celery, golden pascal variety of celery. And that's a, uh, the whole, the whole uh, celery is gonna be a little bit yellow in color as the name would suggest. And we're also gonna do another uh, variety of celery. So I'll just make up some of our labels here. What I like to do is kind of a felt pen so that it's easier to see. Sometimes like last year, I, I wrote with just a regular pen and it was a little bit more difficult to read. So you, if you have something that has more of a felt nature to it, uh, that's gonna be helpful. We're gonna be doing two rows here of celery. One's in the, each one of these is about five in, in each row. The golden, uh, the golden Pascal is a longer, takes a longer amount of time. It's 110 days to maturity and uh, golden color. I just jotted some of the seeds packets you're gonna notice, they don't give you a lot of details about them. And this is the urban farmer here. Um, also, you know, when we've ordered from Johnny Seeds. So I'll go down and, and add a little bit of detail on there so I can remember. The uh, Tango Celeries are going to, are 90 days to maturity. And the seed depth that we're gonna be planting these is at an eighth of an inch deep, which is essentially just, just underneath the surface of the soil uh, versus um, our tomatoes are gonna be a little deeper, but not much, just like a quarter inch underneath. Um, this was a seed that we grew last year. We really had a good luck with it. Um, the, it's called Defiant. It is, a, it is a hybrid. And we have a lot of, we've had some disease problems in our garden. And there's a bit of a story about that. Um, and I find that this, our reason for wanting to share these experiences with you is Gardening's a lot about trying things and then, and then having failures, really, and learning from those. And I know when we started homeschooling our, our kids, uh, a wonderful friend, mother, shared with me some of her experiences from, from homeschooling for almost 20 years, and we were new, new to it. And it helped so much, just the, the false starts, the things that, that didn't work, and the things that did. And so for us, we've been gardening, I've been gardening my whole life, and so We've struggled in different areas, and I hope that by sharing what our family's done, that you wouldn't have to experience those things, or you'll kind of have a leg up if you're if you're entering into the gardening world. So one of the things that happened to us when we moved into our home is we built some raised beds, and we were so excited to fill them, plant them, get them going, and so we went to our local uh, dump, I guess you call it, or recycling center, and they had... Uh, compost and it was free and so we got this these big buckets of, of it and filled up our 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 raised beds and we found out that we really did have wonderful soil initially but we brought in soil that had almost every type of tomato disease 
And I mean, we had early wilt, late wilt, we had black spots, we had every kind of, all these different diseases. And we were, we've were we been battling that all these years of, uh, we've been here 17 years in our home. So I am meticulous. I'm so careful about soil and bringing new things in. And so we have our enclosures, that's brand new area that wasn't part of our original gardens. So we're very careful. In our greenhouse, we've removed the soil that's in there, brought in new, We've really made efforts to try to start over. Um, one of the gardening courses I took, they did say you can leave soil fallow for seven years um, in order to try to get rid of disease that you may have. Of course, I didn't. we have a small yard. I don't wanna leave something fallow. But what I've tried to do is a lot of crop rotation and add heavy heapings of good organic matter from our, our kitchen, um, scraps from the table that are vegetable matter and things like that, hay and uh, chicken manure and some seaweed from a local our local lake and all sorts of things to try to improve what we have, heavy helpings of good things. And over time, things have improved and we've, but I, one thing I've had to do is pick a few varieties of tomatoes that are um, specifically designed to have a lot of um, disease resistance. And I still try to use some of the more traditional varieties, um, especially in the areas that we've created that are new that I'm very, very careful with our seeds um, and the soil rather. And so this variety, Cherokee Purple, it's a wonderful uh, slicer and with great taste. And um, it's, uh, they, they say it has 75 to 90 days to maturity. So it's going to take longer than our other variety that I mentioned, the Defiant. Um, and here are the size of the seeds. So some seeds are gonna be even smaller. If you had some of the um, very small uh, cherry tomatoes, the seeds will be much smaller than this. So this is these are pretty good sized seeds. So I've just taken a, a bunch of those in my hand and now I'm gonna get um, my instrument of choice here, which is, and you can use different things. Uh, something pointy is good if you have anything pointy. Now, last year we had uh, we had pots that were a little bit bigger, and I planted multiple seeds. So this time, I think um, I think I'll continue doing two seeds, just because in the event that something doesn't germinate, we don't want to lose time. So I'm just going to pop these in. They're just a quarter of an inch, like that, and we're just going to pat that down. And really, probably your finger is the best thing for patting. So just keep track of which ones you've done and which ones you haven't, so. We like to have a lot of tomatoes. So I'll plant a whole flat of one variety and that, that um, won't be unusual for us because we'll, we'll grow a number of different varieties and we keep tucking things. Um, I think I mentioned to you when we harvest our garlic, we do a late planting of tomatoes. So these, some of our tomatoes will end up keeping in our house on our radiators through a good bit of the summer till about middle of, middle of July. And then what we'll do is put them out and they're very leggy. And one would say, how is this gonna work? But there's something about that time of the season that the seeds and the plants, they just, seem to intuitively know that they need to get growing quickly. And so we found that now last two years I've done this, that they just uh, make up for time. They thicken up the, the stems and we have a wonderful ha fall harvest of tomatoes, which is nice because a lot of times these early tomatoes that I'm planting by September, their branches are getting a little bit of yellow and you may have some disease setting in possibly, um, some spots or things in your yard. And so it's nice to have some fresh new plants that are taking off, that are robustly producing tomatoes. So we're just on our last two here, Keep purple. Now you could start these seeds in the middle of March 
and you'd be fine. Uh, figure eight weeks before you want to set them out. So you could say, I'm a little early here. We're on February 24th. And sometimes I start them in the middle of February and they're ready to go out in the middle of April. And herein lies the, the interesting situation is that we often have warm days in April and invariably I'm tempted to put them outside early. And sometimes I do because I think oh, I'm going to get ahead and jump on the season and they're going to be bigger and we'll get our food earlier. But last year we had some heavy winds and it really tossed the plants around and uh, it ended up breaking some of them. And so I'm starting them a little later um, this year and I probably will do maybe this planting and then in another week or so we may do more plantings and so forth with more varieties and things like that. Um, but uh, it's really up to you in terms of your seasons. Our, our last frost is around May 15th. So on the Feast of St. Isidore the Farmer. So that's a good good measure of time to be able to know um, how long to plan to start them before. And they'll tell you on the seed packets how many weeks before you should set them out. So each variety might be slightly different. Um, this variety also I should mention is an indeterminate. So for tomatoes, they'll tell you it's either determinate or indeterminate. Indeterminate means more vine-like and determinate means more compact. So for small garden spaces, determinate tends to be nice. Um, you need a little less staking. Uh, the early girl variety is one that my mom and I have always loved. It's very, it's a determinant. It's got nice thick, thick branches um, and compact with good size, uh, good slicer. Uh, but some of these older varieties such as the Cherokee purple are indeterminate. So they're going to be more vine-like and you'll see if they actually, if you allow the vine to fall into the dirt, it'll start to send down roots and that is a, a strengthening for the, for the plant. The other variety I mentioned that we will be growing is the Defiant, and that is a determinant variety. It's also bred for a disease resistance, as I mentioned, but also uh, early an early production. So that one only has uh, 65 days to the first fruiting um, versus, as I mentioned, this variety was, was much longer. So, um, and then I have some, uh, actually a joint disability, so I can't lift very much, but this is just filled very little, so it's very light and I put warm water in it. And the key here is gonna be, you don't wanna put so much water that things wash away. So you're gonna be very gentle with this watering. Go to the next one. And you're gonna keep these moist, so you don't, don't flood it. You know, you'll be adding water over the days ahead. And the nice thing about these containers is they, they absorb the water. So if you've put too much, it's gonna absorb some of that water and then it's gonna retain it so when it does start to dry out. Now we put these on our radiators. Uh, we have an older home with big tall radiators. And that is amazing for starting seeds. Um, some people will have a, a heated mat and that certainly helps. But this way, and I'm not sure if that's one of our seeds. If that's one of our seeds that washed up, I'm pushing it down. There's one. So if you happen to see a seed come up, because these aren't, these are small seeds. So if you see a seed come up, you just push it back down again. And that's it. So I'm just about out of water here. So I'll, we'll be getting some more water. Um, but that, that's how I would approach tomatoes. And tomatoes are gonna be one of those vegetables that most of our home gardeners are going to want to start early. I mean, that's kind of the, one of the wonderful things about having a home garden is coming in and bringing those tomatoes because you can do so much with them. Uh, making your sauces, fresh slicers, uh, all sorts of things, um, pasta dishes. And we have a number of different recipes we like to use with tomatoes, um, a tomato strata. And they're often very, very expensive in the farmer's market. So if you can grow these at home, it's really a help for the family too. So uh, this will be a big part of what we start early. But last year we had the happy, it really was an a, a, um, accident. We, we almost started everything in our whole garden by seed from ourselves, either direct sow or early. But there were a couple things I picked up. I picked up a couple things of parsley, some annuals. And in looking for parsley, I accidentally grabbed some early celery. So they look very similar in their smaller phases. And um, they were looking so healthy uh, that we, we ended up placing them in the garden, the stone garden bed around our, our um, 
greenhouse. And interestingly enough, they always say celery is one of the hardest things for gardeners to grow. It's, it doesn't like real cold. It doesn't like real hot. It needs to be very moist. The soil has to be very wet. And we just had set up drip, a drip irrigation system. So the soil was very moist. So, and it was because of it being in a stone bed, it was, there was a lot of good drainage. Cellar did amazing. So one of the things about cellar, when it says it's sensitive to cold, that means when it's young, when it's first going in, you don't want it to be out when it's, it's going to, uh, they said if it, it gets a frost that it can end up um, flowering too soon. And of course you don't want the flowers, you want the, the stalks. So, uh, but if you have a mature plant and even goes into the fall, which was happening with us, ours actually made it through the summer without bolting. And we had it into the fall. We put, we put hay around it and it did remarkably well. We ended up using it a lot in, of course, pasta, uh, potato salads, pasta salads, and then of course in our soups and things like that. So um, celery, so I'm, we had bought it as little six packs, but we're gonna try growing celery ourselves. Um, and since this is the variety that takes the longest to grow, um, the Pascal, uh, the golden Pascal. Now these seeds are tiny. So they're almost, they're just like a speck. Okay. So I think what the best way we're, we're gonna do here is I'm just gonna sprinkle some of these on here. And then we're gonna put just a, a little bit of dirt over them because, and what they, what, you know, what it mentions is you, you can pull out some of these extra plants later, but they're a very long seed to germinate. So it takes them a bit more than two weeks to germinate. And because of the small size, um, you know what I just did though? One, two, three, four, five. I just sprinkle those. I just did five and I only wanted to do five. So actually that's enough. And we'll just shift some of these around. So before I do the next ones, these, these five here are gonna be our golden Pascal. So those ones are fine. We'll just move these all into one line. So um, I'm just gonna get an uh, instrument here to Get some soil. All right, so now I'm gonna just take a little bit of soil and gently, ever so gently. Now this soil, since it's winter time, I brought this soil into our greenhouse to defrost because if you've got this heavy big bag here, if you keep it outside, it's gonna freeze solid. So this has not been wet, but there's a lot of moisture in it. As I'm feeling it, this has got a lot of moisture. So the nice thing is you don't have to do a lot of water here at first because I don't want these to wash away. So the nice thing here is we're just adding a little bit and there's quite a bit of moisture in this and one thing you can do with celery seeds, which I did not do, but you, which some people do suggest, is that you can soak your seeds the night before, especially when they're super tiny. I've never needed that with tomatoes, but you might find you have some, it helps these things germinate quicker, is if you soak them the night before. So these five are done, and these are all um, the golden Pascal. So we'll, we'll go ahead and shift these around, but, um, this is, this is our, you know, this is the start to our seeds, um, beginning our seeds for the year. And we're really excited to share it with you. Um, but we're going to show you where we place these in, um, on our radiators. And I also want to show you our, our uh, nasturtium too, that we've started. So we've got some more things to show you in terms of the seed starting, but this is, this is, the, these are the basics. Well, these are our tomatoes that we've just planted, our Cherokee purple tomatoes. And you can see I have them on an old style radiator. This is how we heat our home as we have these tall radiators, which are just perfect for helping those seeds to know it's time to sprout. So if you don't have something like this, you might consider using a little heating mat, but I think I've also tried them um, just under lights 
and without an under a surface of heating and, and they will germinate. Uh, but I always just cover our radiators with a, a dish towel and we'll just kind of keep these moist. These will grow up and they'll very quickly have two leaves. Um, we'll expect to see seeds here that we're starting in about seven to 14 days. And uh, it's, it's very exciting as the spring progresses to see your, your plants maturing. Uh, but this is the location that we we line all our radiators. It's quite a sight in, um, in the spring as we're starting all our plants. Today we're on day 27 since starting our celery seeds. And we're, they're starting to look more recognizable as celery. We've got more than two leaves on a couple of these plants. And some are still pretty small. I just went ahead and watered these and although I do a little bit from the top, a lot is from the bottom, filling up the tray with some water and it just wicks up the into these pots. And again, having the cow pots is really nice because it holds the moisture and prevents them from really drying out. So that's been very, very helpful in make, making sure that these tiny seedlings don't dry out too much. Well, we're on day 35 since starting our seedlings, and I thought this was a good time to regroup because we wanna just kinda of see how have we done since we started our seedlings. And you can see over here, we've got our Cherokee purple. Those are looking really healthy. Uh, and those are 75 days to 90 days for to maturity. And our defiant variety of tomatoes those are a little shorter in terms of their days to maturity, 65. And you can see how much difference uh, we have in the two different tomato varieties in terms of their height. So the Defiant are already taking off in terms of growth compared to the, the heirloom variety here, our, our Cherokee purples, which are a little bit smaller at this point. So you just have to, to calculate it, that into your planning in terms of when you wanna be harvesting your tomatoes. So it's kind of nice to have different varieties that some come in early, some come in a little later, which is which is nice. Uh, but I'm really happy in terms of how they look. We started them on a, on the radiators, which the heat from the radiators really allows them to germinate quickly. And we kept them there a couple of weeks and then we ended up moving them to some grow lights in part because we wanted to bring other plants that we've been growing or starting from seed onto the radiators. And so for space purposes, we move them out, but you could keep them all the, the whole time on the radiators. And probably in another couple of weeks, we'll move them onto the, uh, out to our greenhouse and then eventually into the garden. You could, um, tomorrow's I think April 1st. So that's about six weeks till our last frost. But realistically, you could put these outside in another two weeks and they would be fine. So. We started ours a bit early, but if you were starting things now, you'd have plenty of time to be able to get them uh, started and then in the ground. And the cow pots are really nice too because you can plant them completely in the pots and you don't have to have that shock that you get when you remove something from the container. And these will have the roots just kind of eventually grow through them and added nutrients from the compost to cow manure. And moving on here also to our celery. So we've got two different varieties, the golden Pascal up front, and we also have tango in the back. The tango comes to maturity in 90 days and the golden Pascal 110 days. So again, you're seeing with different varieties, a difference in how they're, they're growing right off the bat. So these ones are a little bit bigger. Having said that, these were almost microscopic seedlings. So You've got to be very careful with them. It's good as we did. We planted a number of plants, a number of seeds. So you end up losing a few because they're just so delicate. Uh, and we watered quite a bit from the tray and allowed it to wick up. And any watering we did from the top was very, very careful. Because if you, uh, when they're really tiny, and this is after a couple of weeks of growth, they were even smaller. You hit that with a lot of water, they can completely be re uprooted and die. So be super careful with those, but these aren't gonna go out into the garden for a little while. And then kind of parting thoughts on this, when you're gonna move your seedlings out into the garden, a good practice is to do something called hardening off, which means exposing them to some of the conditions outside 
before they're gonna go into the garden. So it's very controlled inside our home, but it's obviously a little cooler outside. So bring them outside for the day and get them used to some wind and the colder temperatures. And then if it's still chilly at night, bring them back in again. But that's just allowing them to get used to it before they get put right into the garden. So if you have a greenhouse, you certainly can do that as your transition point. But if you don't, just put them outside on your back patio for some days, a couple days, and uh, before they're gonna head out into the, uh, into the soil of your garden. So, but I'm very, very pleased at all uh, the growth that we've had since starting them 35 days ago.